This is 7 News, the voice of the border. Tonight, thousands enjoy a public holiday for Wodonga's Gold Cup. The French ambassador in Coriong for a bushfire recovery milestone. And social housing tenants demand answers about urgent repairs. 7 News begins now. Good evening. 8,000 punters flocked to Wodonga Racecourse for this year's Gold Cup event. This afternoon's downpour didn't dampen spirits, though, with one of the biggest turnouts in the race's history. Wodonga's public holiday in lieu of the Melbourne Cup. The ladies showing off their finest dress. I created the outfit and then created the hat as well. So um, the hat's got 12 metres of Swiss braid underneath, um, which I've painstakingly placed in, in there. It's amazing. You could see some of these outfits at Flemington. They're absolutely beautiful. While the men scrubbing up to impress. I used the exact same outfit as last year. <laughs> last year I had a bit of success at the races, so I figured why change it up if you've got nothing to change at all. Punters spent up big. Number nine is like my birthday and then number ten was just uh, random. I'm pretty confident. <laughs> Got to be in it to win it. For some, the gamble paid off. Win it, win it. Win it. Today's big cash splash boosting Wodonga's economy. They reckon that it brings about 3.5 million into the city, so it's a, it's a huge event for the whole town and, um, you know, people from all industries really benefit from it. Despite threats of a downpour later this afternoon, this year is one of the biggest turnouts for the Gold Cup, with nearly 8,000 on the books today. I think with COVID now being hopefully sort of in the rearview mirror, people are getting out and about again, so events like this have become really popular. With today's event drawing crowds from beyond the border. People coming from Melbourne so and, and Sydney as well, so they do come from far and wide and, and that's great for the whole city. You know, all the motels have been sold out, um, you know, restaurants and cafes. It's hoped Wodonga's sacred day is here to stay. It's one of the best country cups in Victoria and, and we're just trying to continue to grow that and, you know, you can see from the people around the place at the moment and still pouring through the gates that it is a popular event and something that we hope to just continue to grow and grow. <laughs> Phoebe Worthley, 7 News. What a day, and with the main event wrapping up at four, celebrations continue. We saw that rain roll through later today, making for a wet track, and Phoebe Wordley joins us now from the track. And Phoebe, how were the conditions for the final race? Well, Maddie, that afternoon downpour certainly made for a wetter than usual track, but we saw two local horses secure a podium finish. Boggers, another one, made it home first with Aubrey's Bianca Villano in second, followed closely by Wangaratta's Falaxi. Here are the final stages of today's main event. Another one, 100 metres to go. He's three, four lengths in front. 28 years between cups for Beasley. He joins the Million Dollar Club. Another one. What a horse. Now, on the other side of the barricades, it's more a marathon than a sprint. Looking like celebrations will last well into tonight, Matty. Sounds like a fun day there. Thanks, Phoebe. Phoebe Worthley reporting there for us tonight. Well, Kirsty is here now for a look at today's weather. And Kirsty, as we've seen, it's been a wet afternoon for the Cup. Absolutely, it has, Nick and Maddie. Hello to you both and good evening, everyone. Those scattered showers moved across our regions into the early afternoon. Some areas of heavy downpour, as we heard from Phoebe. Eight millimetres fell in just an hour between 3.30 and 4.30 in Albury. Ten millimetres in Rutherglen so far. Now, as we can see, we slept through another very warm night. A lot of cloud cover trapped in that heat from yesterday. Minimums as much as 16 degrees in Myrtleford and on the border. That's at least seven degrees warmer than our November averages for our minimums. Windy conditions too early this afternoon before that humidity picked right back up. A rainy weekend on the forecast and well into next week too. I'll have that weather forecast shortly. Good for the gardens. We'll see you in a few minutes. Thanks Kirsty. North East Water say they've gone above and beyond to help Moorishai get water supply to a tricky section of Yarrawonga. It comes as the local cricket club, cemetery and school say they'll run out of water before Christmas. North East Water and the Shire are negotiating about the cost. Pleased to say today that Moor has agreed to the solutions we've got with the raw water line. Uh, so we'd be pushing forward with that and we've got a short term solution to get water on straight away. Maura Shire is working towards getting raw water from the Murray to water public facilities such as the cemetery and sporting ovals. 
Years on from the black summer bushfires, the Corion community has celebrated a huge milestone today. An incredible connection to a French village making the opening of its new food share facility possible. A new lease on life for one of Corion's most relied upon services. To have this facility is amazing. We were working out of the old scout hall for many years. And it's all thanks to an extraordinary connection to the other side of the world. The connection is uh, over one century old between Victoria and France, especially with Ville Bretonneuve. Coriong Food Chair opened its brand new facility today. The French ambassador was a special guest at the occasion, touting the incredible story linking a village in France and this Upper Murray community. After the war, uh, there was a huge wave of solidarity uh, coming from Victoria that helped rebuild uh, the village of Ville Bretonneuve that was levelled by the war. The people of Victoria fundraise to try to rebuild, to help rebuild that beautiful town in France. The black summer bushfires sparking inspiration to give back from across the globe. That's when the village Britain felt we need to do something. The generous donations making this new home possible with demand for the service sky high years on from the devastating fires. Families, pensioners, uh, people who are working and are on a low income they can't put food on the table. Once the smoke had gone and the fires had been extinguished, that need continued. Of course, we then had COVID on top of that. Coryong Food Share was just one of the organisations which received funding from those French communities. The Walwa Bush Nursery also received donations to help with its recovery post bushfires. History is, is living. As a reason for which it's important to, when opportunities arise, to step up. A touching message from the French ambassador to the Corion community. Merci beaucoup. J'admire ce que vous faites et uh, j'espère que nous resterons longtemps des amis la France et l'Australie. Claire Sienta, 7 News. A group of fed up public housing tenants has banded together to protest what they say is years of neglect and dodgy repair work. Elderly, disabled and terminally ill residents have accused the Department of Housing of leaving them high and dry. At the very end of their tether, calling a tenants meeting in their community hall, trying to get someone to listen. So I walk around this place and I think that's wrong, that's dangerous. OK, I can show you stuff that's dangerous that the department haven't fixed. Wodonga's Baronia Place is home to these residents, fed up with feeling neglected by the government, worried about the lack of security and the air conditioning units falling apart. People have got rotten window frames because the guttering doesn't work properly. And their window frames are literally rotting out from the inside. 60-year-old Karen Brand needed housing when she was told she had two years to live. Five years later, she's still here and says it's high time the units were repaired properly, but doesn't have much hope. Nothing's getting done. They're not really taking us serious. Well, I've been asking for it to be fixed when I first moved in there. She says she spends nights putting towels at her back window to stop the rain flooding in. I feel for the old people because they just sit there and do nothing like the lady over there, she's got cancer and when she invited us in, all along her wall was mould, it was black mould and she goes, well, I'm dying of cancer so why worry about it, you know? That's, to me, that is just not right. They tell you that it'll happen, it doesn't. They'll tell you they fix it, it doesn't. The Department of Housing has been contacted and say it's looking into the problems. Countless repair jobs and countless elderly residents who've given up on trying to get help. But their message today is just because we live in public housing doesn't mean we matter less. As long as you're feeling better. Oh, oh yeah, I'm fine. Doing their level best to get by. Jacqueline Stanley, 7 News. Up next in 7 News, two of Bright's signature elm trees to get the chop. And Fighting Thick Cold Can gets its very own gym. Bright residents are dismayed to hear of their council's support for the culling of two elm trees lining the entrance to their town. Alpine Shire is recommending the subdivision of land to build about 300 homes. The decision comes despite a petition of 6,000 signatures to save the stately elms. 
Oh, it's terrible news for the community. Um, it's not what we expected at all. We expected them to the council to apply an interim heritage overlay to give the trees some protection. It says they will plant 2,500 established trees within the Western Gateway development. Colcan's first gym opens this weekend. It means gym junkies will no longer have to make the trek to Albury with 50 people already signed up. Base camp strength and fitness is set to change the game in Colcan. Full cardio selection, you know, we've got nine uh, plate loaded pin machines, a full dumbbell range, five squat racks. Residents from Colcan and neighbouring towns will soon have access to a state of the art gym. Kids, you know, being youth age that don't drive, adults and an older population that we have here, you know, it brings something easily accessible to them. From Sunday, it'll operate on a 24-7 basis. It's run by a FOB system, so with your membership you get a FOB and you just basically can use that at any time. The gym's opening will save the 35-minute drive from the town to Albury. In the past, you know, six or so months, we've actually been taking um, carloads of kids with us into the gym in the afternoon. The pair has been working at getting the gym up and running since November last year. It's been a hard process. Um, we obviously work in the town as well. I'm a nurse down at the local hospital. Um, so juggling all that, um, you know, it's really exciting to see. At full capacity, the gym can hold 25 to 30 people and with more than 50 already signed as members, it proves dedication pays off. When we like come to this place, it was just bare bones pretty much and to see it all just come together now, it's just, it's amazing. Rochelle Ponikovic, 7 News. Up next in 7 News, some of the best female golfers in the country tee off. And in cricket, the hoppers hungry and finding their form. We start with cricket tonight and after an unusually slow start by their standards, North Albury is back in form and so too is their best batsman, fresh from a sensational 100 and hungry for more. After making 310 the highest score of the season, North Albury appear to have found their form. No more so than coach Matt Condon, who is coming off perhaps his best innings in the league with 113. Their opponents, Albury, however, not without a chance, looking to push inside the top six with a win. Well, they can upset them, but they won't upset them tomorrow. Matty Conan, good touch, and uh, Benny Fulford and company get the job done. East Albury are coming off just their second loss, but find themselves at home. Alexandra Park regarded as the league's best batting wicket, which should suit Corowa Big Guns Dan Smith and Dan Christian. Huge game for both clubs, really. I think Corowa need to get a win on the board and... Um, you know, Alexander Park needs some great nick, but uh, yeah, I think Cora would nearly get him tomorrow. Lavington will be missing four players, including star fast bowler Ryan Brown, with representative duties. But it's the same for St Pat's in the grand final rematch, who will be missing captain Dean Nicholson. St Pat's coming off two losses, so big game uh, at Lavy number two. Let's hope the rain holds off and get this one underway because it's going to be a cracker. Uh, Lavy probably go in as favourites, but sentimental, we'd have to go with the Pats. It's the derby between Wodonga Raiders and Wodonga at Biralee Park, which is the competition's toughest ground to bat on. Wodonga Raiders, for me, I think they've probably been a little bit of a surprise packer. They've got some good players, some good young talent there, and I think they'll get the win. New City are at home, and along with Baron Duda, are looking for just their second win. In the final game, Talangata are at home to Belvoir. Belvoir currently on a six-game winning streak, with arguably the longest batting list in the competition. Belvoir for me, they're probably the team to beat at this stage. It's only early, but between them and North Albury, probably the teams to catch, and I think Belvoir should get the win. But Johnny Oswald have a big game. Stephen Murphy, 7 News. Bethanga will have their unbeaten district record put to the test tomorrow. They take on Dederang, who are sitting in third. Meanwhile, Esther will be hoping to cause a big upset. In Hume, it's the top four against the bottom four, with the best game shaping as Rock on Creek against Osborne. To Wangaratta and District now, and it's the first day of the two-day game, with Ovens Valley against Rovers United, the pick of the matches, and Riverina are through to the T20 final in Sydney next year after two strong New South Wales country championship wins. 
It is set to be a record-breaking weekend for Albury Wodonga table tennis. 106 players will converge on the Albury Centre this weekend, the club's largest veterans event. The tournament is part of a Victorian series with players earning overall points towards a state title. It's a strong field with previous Victorian and national champions competing. The club is expecting to host some big tournaments in the new year. To water polo now, and it's the battle of the two teams this weekend. They've been separated by a combined total of one goal in their opening two matches. Now, one of the biggest local sporting rivalries ignites again. They are clearly the two best sides in the early part of the season, but who is best is anyone's guess. After a draw, Pool Pirates defeated Sharks by a goal in their second encounter, and now it's Battle of the Pool number three. I'd like to think that we are the better side and we've got um, more to show as the season goes on. But I also think, really, if you're gonna um, if you're gonna be realistic, we've had a draw and a loss by one. So I think at this point in time, it's fair to say that we're neck and neck because the scorelines speak for themselves. Travelling from Melbourne each week, Millie Pulley Blank has starred this season in her first year as a shark. With the new-looking Sharks outfit, Pulley Blank believes the team is yet to gel, but when they do, look out. We had a couple of rounds where we weren't particularly 100% happy with how we played, so we're trying a few new things as the season goes on. So I think it's just kind of like chipping away, finding the style that works for us, and then once we've found it, like sticking with it and maximising that and the opportunities that come from it. The match will be played at Wodonga's Waves Pool from 12pm Sunday with a winner to take top spot. It's expected to be a close match with neither side reaching double figures in their previous encounters. Meanwhile, Stingrays and Albury Tigers kick off the action from 11.15am and Pulley Blank thinks it will come down to personnel. So I, I, I want to say Tigers purely for the fact that they've been the most consistent. But the Stingrays, like their team chops and changes so much each week that who knows, this week could be theirs, I don't know. Meanwhile, the men's clash from 12.45pm is another top-of-the-ladder matchup. Sharks have defeated Stingrays twice this season, but their last game ended with 14-year-old Toby Gould scoring with a final shot. Stephen Murphy, 7 News. Some of the best female golfers in Australia have taken a swing at securing a $50,000 payday at the Wagga Country Club. 36 professionals were on the course as the final day of a history-making tournament captivated fans right around the nation. With a $50,000 cheque and two tickets into the women's New South Wales Open up for grabs, the stakes were high at the Walker Country Club. Golf New South Wales have created a series of um, qualifying events for the New South Wales Open. So uh, we were at Molly Mook uh, earlier in the week and uh, here this week. After finishing tied for 13th in Molly Mook, Sunshine Coast talent Vicky Yuland. Entered the final round of the Women's New South Wales Open Golf Regional Qualifying Series event, sharing the lead with Englishwoman Amy Taylor. Um, but plenty of players who are certainly in contention. I mean, there's a couple in three, a couple on two under, a couple on one under, and then, you know, anyone in the top probably three or four groups is, is a chance. I had a good day yesterday. Um, scoring wasn't as low as um, our practice day, which was good. <laughs> um, the conditions were a bit tougher, so, um, yeah, it was nice to make a few putts and be in the position I am today. Taylor only touched down in Australia last week. This is uh, my second event on the WPGA. I love it here. The girls are so friendly. It's a really good, talented field, um, as is next week at the Australian Open. The Queenslander is no stranger to the New South Wales Open, but next year's event holds extra appeal. It's at Magenta Shores next year, so that's a bit exciting. I haven't played there, so it would be very nice to be able to get a spot into that. Golfers reserved high praise for the Waka course. I really like the course. Um, it reminds me of a course I used to play out in the States. I've been here for 20 odd years playing golf and this is probably the best I've ever seen the golf course. In a historic first for the club, today's action was televised live on KO. To sort of help accommodate that, we've, we're staying, t starting teeing off the 10th today, which means the players will finish on the 9th, which is right in front of the clubhouse, which will be full of members. Steph Muir, 7 News. Up next in 7 News, Kirsty's back and she's got a look at what's happening with the weather over the weekend. That's next.
Welcome back everyone. A low pressure system is generating unstable weather while troughs over New South Wales are triggering showers and thunderstorm activity. We're feeling humid conditions too with warm winds being pulled southwards into New South Wales and Victoria. We'll likely get a brief period off reprieve through Monday morning before troughs gain moisture again into early next week leading to an increase in rainfall. Some parts of the state could see more than 100 millimetres of rain particularly if severe thunderstorms storms develop. These storms just by their characteristic do give inconsistent rainfall amounts. Broadly speaking though across the border in particular we are expecting some potentially very heavy downpours. Taking a look to our weekend weather forecast first and those showers are expected overnight and across into tomorrow some heavy falls are possible about the mid-afternoon. We're expecting anywhere between 5 and 25 millimetres at their heaviest for the northeast. Slightly heavier though around parts of the high country. Cloudy Skies, mild temperatures though remaining in the high 20s at Mansfield and for Wangaratta. That wet weather tracking into Sunday but reducing back to no more than just a few millimetres for the border at Albury Wodonga. The high country could see up to 10 millimetres of rain around midday. Clearer skies elsewhere though, a light breeze and temperatures sitting in the low 20s at Beechworth with a top of 22. Into Monday we will get that slight reprieve from that wet weather. Partly cloudy in the north, Benalla reaching 25 degrees, Cobram a top of 26, although there is that chance still of some thunderstorms rumbling around Falls Creek and Mount Hotham. A fairly light breeze for Shepparton, 12 overnight and reaching a maximum of 25 degrees. If we take a closer look at next week, new troughs will generate more significant wet weather through Tuesday and into Wednesday. Over the coming eight days or so, we could see totals of over 100 millimetres of rain and certainly a wet weekend to kick it all off. It is going to be very wet this week indeed. Right. Thanks for the update. Kirsty, see you later. And that is your local news for the night and for the week. Thanks for watching. You can always catch up on our website or at 7 Plus. 7 News from Melbourne is coming up next. Have a lovely weekend. We'll see you again on Monday night from 6 o'clock. We'll see you there.